you know, on one hand, your revenue of $2.5 billion beat analyst estimates, so did your net, in net income. But the stock reaction this morning was muted off the first blush. Why do you think that is? Well, it's always, always hard to measure the stock moment to moment. What we tend to focus on is how we delivered over time. And in this quarter, we felt really good about the way we started the year. Uh, we delivered for our clients, which is the most important thing, strong performance. Also, in terms of our financial results, we felt very good. What I'd say is exciting is a couple of positive trends. One, the market has reopened the capital markets. We're seeing a lot more transaction activity. Equity markets are stronger, debt markets. You see that in your reporting. And then we're also seeing a reacceleration in our private wealth area individual investors coming to our products, pleased with our performance, improved market sentiment. And our private credit area has really incredible momentum. We crossed over $400 billion in terms of private credit or credit overall, real estate and corporate, over $200 billion, most of that in credit for our insurance clients today. And it's just another area where people are embracing the Blackstone model. So um, it's hard to measure things moment to moment in the stock market, but we're very pleased with where we sit today. I'm glad you brought up private credit here because your credit business brought in more money than any other business. How does that momentum keep going into the year? Can you keep it up? Yes, we feel really good about it. I mean, one of the drivers, of course, is performance. If you looked at non-investment grade private credit, Last 12 months, it's delivered 17% appreciation. So you've got a lot of happy clients in that area. You also have a secular shift going on, not only in non-investment grade, but in investment grade private credit. You've got insurance companies who are looking to expand what they've done historically. They've done mortgages historically, but now working with folks like us on things like single family mortgages or residential, uh, I'd say also uh, infrastructure lending um, that could be digital, green energy, a whole range of activities, asset back finance, fund finance. And so there's a broadening of how we serve these insurance clients. There's a broadening of how we're serving pension funds and individual investors. And I think, you know, if you look back over time, if you think about 60, 40 for investors, 60 equity, 40 fixed income, a large portion of that 60 has moved to the private area to alternatives over the last 30 years. And yet in the fixed income bucket, most of that has stayed liquid. And I think we're in the early days of an expansion in terms of um, alternatives in fixed income in a range of areas. And that gives us a lot of enthusiasm. That's private credit. On the private equity side, you still see realizations not meeting the mark here. Do you think that the markets will pick up drastically this year, or is it going to be a long time coming before we see deal exits at a more significant scale? Well, if you think about where we are in this cycle, um, you know, after two years of pretty slow M&A activity, transaction activity, it's picking up, as I noted before. And what you tend to do in this part of the cycle is focus on deployment. Uh, you've seen a big pickup from us in deployment the last couple quarters. I think that'll continue because we think there are attractive opportunities out there across a range of sectors. And then as you think about realizations, you know, getting companies ready to, say, to sell, um, doing IPOs, those sort of things take a bit of time. And what you want to do is do it in a deliberate fashion. Our model means we're not for sellers of assets. So I think you will steadily see a pickup, but it'll take time. It'll be probably more towards the end of the year and into 2025. Um, our investors are focused us on maximizing returns, and we think that's the right way to do it, to be deliberate in terms of realizations. But a recovery in capital markets, debt and equity, is an important early sign as we move towards that realization cycle looking forward. Can you have significant M&A with the interest rate cycle staying this high, given that the expectations have changed so much for the number of rate cuts this year? Well, interestingly, um, we have seen changes here. Although short rates are not coming down, we've seen a little bit of a tick up in long rates. Cost of capital has actually come down pretty materially from, say, the October highs. High yield spreads have tightened 100 basis points. 
commercial mortgage-backed security spreads probably 125 basis points. And not only has the cost of that debt capital come down, the availability has gone up materially. And so I think that's an important first step. I think that's why you're seeing a pickup in transaction activity. You are right that as the Fed cuts rates, it will be easier for people to do transactions, and you'll see more of a pickup. But even with rates at this more elevated level, I think you'll see more transaction activity given that reduction in cost of capital. Do you think at least one rate cut this year is achievable, or is even that looking more unlikely? You know, I think it is achievable. I think the Fed has had some real success on inflation. You know, we had inflation north of nine. Now it's three and a half percent. Um, the pace of disinflation has slowed, but the path is still downward. When we look at our large portfolio, 12,000 real estate assets, 230 companies, what we see is input costs at the manufacturing businesses are pretty flat. We see um, we see hotel room rates that have in some cases turned modestly negative. Apartment rents are pretty flat. And when we look at wages, a year ago at our companies, they were growing 5%, now 4%. So I think the Fed will get some data that's positive, give them some room. But I do think they'll be patient and deliberate. So an expectation of fewer cuts, a little more delayed makes sense. But ultimately, I think for investors, what matters is rates will at some point be coming down. And that's a positive. And as investors, particularly us with nearly $200 billion of capital, we want to try to find ways to deploy things before the all clear sign, something we've begun to do, particularly in real estate at scale. Speaking of scale, $10 billion deal for apartment realty, the apartment income rate air as it's known. Are you willing to keep writing checks that big in the real estate sector? Well, we've done a number of big checks in real estate really over the last five months or so. Uh, it started with the $17 billion signature bank loans, which we did a partnership with the FDIC on. We did a big joint venture with Digital Realty, $7 billion in the data center space. Uh, we announced a Tricon residential transaction earlier this year, single family rentals and some multifamily apartments. That was a $7 billion total enterprise deal. And then most recently, Air Communities, which you noted, a $10 billion transaction. And so what's giving us confidence in real estate is the sentiment's negative. Uh, investors are very cautious. And yet on the ground, we're beginning to see cost of capital come down and really importantly, a reduction in new supply. So multifamily building in the U.S. is down. The starts are down about 50 percent. And overall, if you look at the amount of housing in the United States we're building, it's about the same as 1960, even though our population is nearly doubled. So again, we're willing to take a contrarian view, and we do think it's a compelling time to invest in real estate before this proverbial all clear sign. Would you say it's the return of the mega deal, certainly for real estate, if not also potentially private equity? I think it's still early to call that. I think we're a bit of an exception given our access to capital and scale. Um, we've begun to see larger transactions. I think you'll see more of them in the corporate area, which is further along given the way public equity markets have rallied. Um, and the tightening spreads we're seeing in the uh, non-investment grade debt area. So I, I guess I would say uh, I think it'll gradually grow in scale. There's a lot of capital out there. M&A activity has been quite muted the last couple of years. Um, so I think it'll grow, but it takes time. If you went back and looked at the previous declines in M&A volumes in the early 90s after the financial crisis, it took a number of years to build out. I think the key thing is we've hit a low ebb in terms of transaction activity last year. It's going to start to build, you know, off of that and it'll start to grow. And yes, you know, rates coming down will help that and people's confidence growing capital markets healing will help that. This is mm -hmm. cyclical and I do believe at some point you'll be talking about larger transactions. John, I want to talk about the AI opportunity here. Of course, it's been a large one for Blackstone. Your real estate business alone has benefited from the growth of these data center businesses off that AI boom. Do you ever worry that the AI boom will start to slow? 
Well, AI is really powerful, and you hear that from lots of the folks you talk to, these large language models, what they're going to be able to do in terms of customer engagement for companies, content creation, software, media, I think it's going to be really game-changing in many, many ways. Um, what's interesting for us is we've really focused on the infrastructure around AI. And there, there's just a need for an enormous amount of compute power uh, and power itself. And what we focus on mostly, of course, is these data centers. Um, you know, if you look at demand for data centers, if you went back uh, four years ago, it's grown about 11 fold in the United States. It's pretty remarkable. Today, we have about $50 billion of data centers that we either own across our portfolio or are under construction. And around the world, including places like Europe and India and Japan, and some more in the US, we have another 50 billion under various stages of development. And what makes me feel good about you know, the risk always when you're deploying that kind of capital is, is there an excess? I'd say a couple things. One is we tend, we don't build these things on a speculative basis. You only do this if you have a long-term lease from a major technology company. And the second thing is the shortage of power uh, is becoming pronounced in a number of places, and that's becoming a limiting factor on how many of these centers can build. So we think this is a big area. It's really the physical manifestation of AI, and it feels like it still, still has a long way to go. John, before I let you go, when you look across Wall Street, there's really a concern about compensation costs, pressure on comp costs going higher, as well as overall expenses. How do you see Blackstone's hiring plans this year compared to a year ago? I would expect we'll hire more people than we did a year ago, given the growth in some of our businesses, what's happening in our infrastructure business, what's happening in our credit businesses, our secondaries business. I think uh, we're going to grow, probably not as fast as we did you know, back in 2021. Uh, but we think we're in a secular growth industry. We're the leader in that industry. We continue to get good inflows. We had 34 billion of inflows just in the first quarter. That requires more people. And the key for us is to continue to deliver great performance. If we do that, we'll grow and we'll need to hire more folks here at 345 Park Avenue and around the globe. John, we thank you so much for your time, especially before the earnings call. Hope to talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shanali.